the topical issue in the name of um, Deputy uh, Desi Ellis to the Minister for Environment, Community and Local Government. The need for protections for rent supplement and rental accommodation schemes tenants who face eviction due to the financial difficulties of their landlords. Deputy Ellis has uh, four minutes to make an initial statement. Minister, rent supplement and RAS are two schemes which, despite their flaws and the large cost to the state, are holding, are holding housing at the brink and have been doing so for a number of years now. We have never had such a great need for social housing, with figures on waiting lists as high as 98,000 and 124,000 or so people on rent supplement and RAS. Without these schemes, due to the absolute refusal of the government to provide real sustainable public housing, we would not have simply a housing crisis, we would have a housing catastrophe. It is for this reason I raise this very serious issue today. Across the state, and especially in Dublin, we are facing a crisis within a crisis. This is the problem of landlords who are not paying their mortgages, and in doing so are jeopardising the housing of potentially thousands of people. In the last few weeks, I personally dealt with about five families in Dublin alone who are facing eviction due to the repossession of their rented homes. The lenders want to sell and wash their hands of the property, in some cases forcing the landlord to evict the families before they take over, even though these families are paying and are up to date. I spoke to Emma, mother of two from Drimna. 13 years on the waiting list, afraid to leave her home to go to the speak to the council because she might come home to find that she has been evicted. But she is also afraid to sit in, not knowing what she will face when the knock comes at the door. Emma is on RAS. Dublin City Council promised her when signing up to the RAS that she would not be allowed to go homeless. Now she is facing just that. She should be guaranteed housing. She was promised under the scheme housing and she was promised that that would continue. To be fair to Dublin City Council, I believe they wish to do this, but how can that be done when social housing is in such short supply and funding is being cut? We need solutions to these problems. My colleague, Councillor Crean Lady Dalek, tells me in her part of the city, she believes there are about 50 people in the early stages of what Emma is going through. The big solution is to provide sustainable public housing, which is not endangered by the whims of the market or lenders or profit-driven landlords. You know this as well as I do, Minister. The more immediate solution is to force lenders to enter into a code of conduct in relation to tenants, especially those with an assessed social housing need who could be said to be particularly at risk of homelessness in the event of eviction. This should also include a recognition that tenants have paid for deposits and made commitments which should be honoured by those in control of the property. Rent supplement and RAS tenants cannot afford to lose deposits and be thrown onto the street. Whatever is done, the government needs to have a strategy to deal with these grave problems and ensure people are not left homeless. You cannot pretend this is not happening. As we face increased repossessions from banks and lending institutions, this will only become worse if nothing is done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy. <clears throat> Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, The grounds upon which a tenancy in the private rented residential sector may be legally terminated are clearly set out in the Residential Tenancies Act of 2004. The Act provides the main regulatory framework for the private rented residential sector and for the operation of the Private Residential Tenancies Board. The Act provides for security of tenure and specifies minimum obligations for landlords and tenants under a tenancy. In addition, the Act contains <coughs> provisions relating to the setting of rent and rent reviews and sets out the procedures and notice periods that must be complied with when terminating a tenancy. The ongoing development of a stable, well-regulated rented sector is a key goal for this Government and stability of tenure is fundamental to that goal. The legal framework set out in the Act marked a, seas a sea change in this regard and the guarantee of secure four-year tenancies once the initial six-month probationary period has passed apply regardless of whether the tenant is in receipt of rent supplement, has a tenancy under the, the rental accommodation scheme or is, in is not in receipt of any assistance from the state. The maximum duration of a tenancy under the Act is four years, after which a new tenancy must be registered with the Board. 
Where a tenant has been in occupation of a dwelling for a continuous period of six months and no notice of termination has been served in respect of the tenancy before the expiry of the period of six months, the tenancy continues in being for the remainder of the four-year period, and this is referred to in the Act as Part, uh, part 4 Tenancy. A landlord may not serve a notice of termination on such a tenant except in very clear defined circumstances, such as a failure by the tenant to comply with his or her obligations in relation to the tenancy, where the landlord intends to sell the property within three months after the termination of the tenancy, or where the landlord requires the dwelling for his or her own occupation or for that of a family member. The Rental Accommodation Scheme is an initiative that was announced by the Government in July 2004 to cater for the accommodation needs of persons in receipt of rent supplement, normally for more than 18 months, or who were assessed as having a long-term housing need. One of the main features of the scheme is that local authorities, in sourcing accommodation for these households, make use of the private sector and enter into contractual arrangements to secure medium to long-term availability of rented accommodation. A res residential tenancy agreement is entered into by all three parties, and as with the other such arrangements, the tenancy is governed by the Residential Tenancies Act 2004. Notwithstanding this, as RAS is deemed to be a social housing support, the local authority <coughs> retains the responsibility to source further accommodation for a RAS household should the dwelling that the household is living in become unavailable through no fault of their own. Thank you, Minister. Deputy, you have two minutes. So, Minister, this is precisely the problem that we're facing, that people, the, the banks are, there's a lot more banks now looking for repossessions, and landlords are now starting to hand these up. There is no way um, that I can see that we're going to fulfil um, anyone who's under RAS getting new places and, and, being, and getting sourced very quickly, because there's going to be an awful lacking in properties. And some figures that were released from Dublin City Council to councillors um, that the RAS scheme cost a million more in Dublin City Council than they are given from it. Can you confirm that that is true? And is this the case in other local authorities? And what happens if RAS properties can't be found or we can't find some other properties? What, uh, what are we going to do? Can banks such as Al Ulster Bank be requested to keep tenants in situ? And can a code of conduct be put in place? You know, I spoke to Ulster Bank. I have a, two very serious cases. One is where a sheriff is involved, and this family um, have been served notice. Uh, well, the, the landlord was served notice to, to vacate the premises, and it's with the sheriff. So in turn, Ulster Bank informed the tenants and gave them 130 days or so, which is, uh, they're obliged to do, to vacate the, these premises. And the problem here, of course, is where are, they, are these people going to go? They've been paying their rents. Um, they, you know, we're going to go back to the local authority. But surely um, Ulster Bank's argument is that um, uh, these are, these are, um, this sheriff's notice has been served, so we need vacant possession. And that's their argument. So we're not going to talk to the tenants, even though every penny has been paid in rent and it's been paid. And I have another case. Um, that of, of another family that uh, the, the, the landlord is saying, I want to vacate these premises. I've given you 28 days notice. And in, in this case, Ulster Bank is saying, if, there is, if we appoint a receiver, we can negotiate with the tenant. Thank you. But in the other case, where the sheriff is appointed, we can't. Um, I think it's outrageous. We should be trying to keep people in situ that are paying their way and the banks should be talking to these and they should be finding every mechanism to deal with them. Families have been put, in, they've put their families locally, they've, they've uh, sourced schools around the areas and we <coughs> should be keeping them in those areas and this is a major problem coming the, down the road for us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Deputy. Um, yeah, well, can I thank Deputy Ellis because I mean there certainly are issues and um, I met with the Irish Banking Federation recently um, because I was concerned at the role of receivers in particular um, and um, we've asked them to and, and they have agreed to draft um, a, a rights document for tenants um, to ensure that they know their rights in, in these contexts. And, you know, it is also important that, that um, the rights of tenants are maintained in these very difficult situations, and their rights are there in statute. There are the, the rights that I referred to in my, in my initial contribution. Um, but, you know, I mean, I would, I, I certainly intend to ramp up the construction programme as soon as I possibly can, Deputy. Um, we are in very difficult economic circumstances. The budgets have been hugely cut, not just in, in the last couple of years since, since 
certainly since I took over this job, but in years before that as well. Um, and um, you know, I, I, I believe that we do need to start <coughs> constructing um, public housing as soon as we possibly can. And I certainly intend to do that as soon as I possibly can, and as soon as we can, we can um, ensure that the funding is there. Um, but in the meantime, we have to use whatever mechaniz mechanisms we have, both to protect the rights of tenants, to ensure that we use the supply that is there in terms of the private sector, um, whether that be through RAS or whether it be through rent supplement. And, um, you know, as you know, we have plans to, to bring the whole thing under the local authorities in the near future. Um, it is difficult, particularly in cities like Dublin, uh, where there, you know, there are issues of supply. Um, but I, I just want to stress again that tenants do have rights in these situations, that they are, um, they are outlined in the legislation. And we want to ensure that those rights are protected. And um, you know, we, we will do that. Um, and you know, if there is information that people need, then we will be happy to supply it. Thank you, Minister. That kind of works in this house, and he wrote a very good book about a man who was leader of the opposition at the time, uh, James Dillon, and the, the, the debates that took place in this chamber during the run-up to the Second World War and in the immediate aftermath of the outbreak of it, and Ireland's position and neutrality and things like that. And it gives you a very interesting insight into the reasons that we did why, what we did and why we did them, and against the people that it was done against. And I think that the context of that needs to be looked at. Was it fair and was it proportionate? And of course it wasn't. And I think now that, we've, that, uh, that, that we're looking to a new era uh, between Britain and Ireland in terms of our relationships, this is coming at a very, very good time, I think, because it's, it can farm part.